Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello and welcome back. This lesson is going to be the first important lesson that you want to know after you have known the parts of the camera. Now, what is a photograph? Before we move on, we need to define it. A photograph is basically capturing light, all right? And if you're able to capture light appropriately, the object something that you're capturing right now. For instance, right now, the camera that's shooting right now is shooting a subject. I'm the subject, all right? And if I'm properly lit up, I say, I've taken a nice photograph. But when we come into photography, we don't say we are properly lit up. We say we are properly exposed. So here comes the first part of our lesson, and that is, what is exposure? So exposure is the amount of light that you as a photographer think is sufficient to light up your subject. For example, right now the camera is shooting me. And if you look at the images popping up on the screen right now, in this image right now, I am underexposed because you see the darker parts of my face right now. But in the next image you see, I am a little more exposed or I would say overexposed in this image. Everything is kind of in short words, blown out, all right? The, the, the resolution, the details are all blown out. It's all going white. The colors are gone, overexposed, okay? And the image that you see right now is sort of a right image, which is properly exposed. So in short, exposure is the amount of light you think is important, you think is sufficient, that you require on the subject, and if you think you want a subject to look darker, that's the right exposure for your image. And if you think you require a little more light in that, that's the right exposure for you. But there are ways to find out if the image is really shot by a professional. And for that, we need to understand how to balance this light appropriately. And for that, there are basic three settings inside the camera. We're going to look at how to use ISO, number two, aperture, Number three, shutter speed. And together, these three make up the exposure triangle. So coming up in the next lessons, we'll be looking at number one, ISO, number two, shutter speed, number three, aperture, and number four, how to balance these in an exposure triangle. Thank you very much for watching. I hope the idea of exposure is pretty much clear to you for now, but how do you really put it into practice is coming up in the next lessons. Hello and welcome back. This lesson is about the f-stop or the aperture. This is how much of the opening is there for the camera. Ideally, you would want to keep this setting depending upon what you really want. This relates to the idea of how sharp or how blurred the background you need. For example, if you're shooting a wide open photograph of a landscape, you want everything clean inside it. So, for that, you want to keep the f-stop higher, somewhere around a 10 or 8 or 12, okay? That gives a crisp view of all the things in the background, in the far, in the closer proximity of your camera. But if you want to have a really beautiful bouquet at the back, if you want something more of a portrait with the backgrounds all blurred, what do you want? you want the f-stop as low as possible, or the f-stop or the aperture, whichever you want to call it, okay? So, how do you adjust that? In this camera, the Canon 80D, at the back that you see right now, this wheel that I'm rotating right now, this wheel actually decides how much of the f-stop am I using right now. So, for example, when I rotate this wheel, I see values popping up on my screen. It's 
2, 2.2, 2.5 and so on. This depends entirely on the lens's ability of how much closer can it go and how wide can it open. Generally speaking, lenses have the ability to open up wide or go extremely squeezed short. Normal kit lenses that come with the camera body inside the pack, they have a higher f-stop value. What does that mean? That means they don't open up too wide, okay? They go really close. So if you want a blurred background, you want to choose a lens which has a lower f-stop, somewhere around 2.0, 1.8, 1.6, all right? So this lens that I have right now, this one is a Sigma art lens, F1.8. This is a beast, all right? This is a beast. This really blows away all the background in uh, your image and keeps your subject really sharp. I leave some images shot from my Canon 60 that I have right now for use for your examples. And we're going to shoot some images with them and show you how the f-stop affects the background. The higher the f-stop, the more clear the background. The lower the f-stop, the sharper the image of the subject and the more blurred the background. We will cover up this concept of depth of field in more detail in the coming lessons. But since we are covering up this section in terms of exposure, so a lower f-stop opens up the lens wider and you get more light. So the icons coming here are going to point at what we have covered so far. So number one, the ISO. ISO somewhere around 200 to 400, max to an 800. The shutter speed, somewhere around the value of the lens range that you have. So if you have an 85 mm, you might want to go around 60 to 80 or 100 uh, shutter speed. And if you have uh, a lens which has the ability to go really wide open, you want to choose what you want to do. If you want to have a clear background, you want to shoot backgrounds and sceneries. You want to keep the S-top somewhere around 10 to 12 in daylight, okay? That's a suitable place to keep the S-top. If you're shooting a portrait of someone and you want the background all blurred out beautifully and creamed out, you would want to keep the F-stop really low. Somewhere around two would be a very, very beautiful depth of field that you'll get from the image. We'll leave some examples for you to look at and we'll move into the next lesson where we are going to see how to balance these all three factors together. Although we've covered all three of these in detail, the ISO, the shutter speed, and the aperture, but we're going to sum it all up in the next lesson. So stay tuned. Hello and welcome back. In the last lesson, we looked at ISO settings, and I'm going to keep a little note over there in this corner telling you what we've covered so far. So we've covered up the ISO, we're keeping it under 800 most of the times, ranging between a 200 to a 400 um, in a normal situation, I would say. Okay, now, assuming that you're in a situation where this ISO is keeping the image really dark, because it will most of the times, unless you're in the open sun, Okay, apart from the ISO setting, what are the other two factors that really affect the amount of light that you will capture in your camera? The second one we are discussing in this episode, and that is shutter speed. Now, what is shutter speed? It is how quickly does your camera click the shutter? Okay, so for instance, if you have it on the wheel, if you have your hand on the wheels over here, if you see in this image uh, with a pointer, if I scroll it, okay, the values on this screen change. So right now I'm at a 60 shutter speed and then 50, 300 and so on, okay? Now, what does this shutter speed actually show? These numbers on the shutter speed show an important value. If they're giving you a value of a 60, that means in 1 60th of a second, the shutter is going to click, all right? So that means your image will be captured in one out of 60 parts of a second. Now that's really fast, yes. If you're shooting something really fast moving, an action or, or a motorcycle jumping off a ramp, all right? You want your shutter speed pretty high because you want to freeze that moment. 
So you might want to go as much as, let's say, 2,000 or 4,000 if you want, or 5,000 shutter speed. And that is when you want to really freeze a really fast moving action. But what if you want to shoot tail lights in the night? Or maybe you want to capture the tail lights of the stars moving in our sky. What do you do then? You have to lower the shutter speed. So shutter speed is basically how long it will take for the camera to click the shutter. So if it remains open for long enough, more light reaches in. If it remains open for a really small amount of time, like that, it is going to receive a really small amount of light. So a quick question, if your object is not moving, like for example, you're taking a photograph of me right now standing in front of you, and the ISO is really low, and you receive something of this image, which is really dark, what would you want to do to the shutter speed? Would you want to click the shutter really fast so that less light comes in? Or would you want that it remains open for long enough so that I get enough light into the camera. To get more light, obviously, you will want to keep the shutter speed low, somewhere around a 60 or a 100, but that's just a number. How do you figure out that how much shutter speed should I keep? Let me give you a tip, okay? If you look at your lens, whichever lens you're using, for example, this is an 18 to 35 mm lens, or if you're shooting at a 85 mm lens, or a 50 mm lens, right? The ones that are popping up right now. Just keep your shutter speed a little higher than that number, okay? And you should be able to shoot portraits and normal moving people perfectly fine. And if you're shooting something really fast, you will have to increase the shutter speed a lot. And if you're shooting something as slow as the stars moving in the sky, or uh, you want to shoot the night sky when you're up top on a hill, what would you want to do? You want to keep the shutter open for long so that it gets the light from the night sky and gives you a beautiful picture. So that is it for shutter speed for now. We're going to leave some sample images for you and you will see how some of these are freezing my moving hand really fast and some of them are just giving a blur. And the blurred ones are the ones where the shutter speed was low and the frozen ones are the ones where the shutter speed was really high. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Hello and welcome to this lesson. We're shooting this lesson the third time because our cameraman got confused with what to do uh, when I ask what. So this lesson is about the ISO settings. Now, what is ISO? On your camera, if you see, right now on this Canon 80D body, you have the ISO button. So when I click on it, it shows me the settings. It is shown as numbers. These ISO numbers actually show how much sensitive your camera sensor is to the incoming light. So for example, if I request my cameraman without doing any more errors to increase the ISO right now, you see it gets brighter, okay? On the other hand, if I request him to drop the ISO down, it becomes darker. So, why would you want to increase the ISO at any point? Well, when you're shooting in the dark, you want a generally higher ISO. Well, there are cameras out there in the market right now that can shoot in extreme pitch black situations, but at a great cost. And that is noise. Look at these two images right now. We've tried to shoot them with the same amount of light overall, but you see one is smoother and the other one has a lot of grain. This grain is called the noise. When you're shooting at a higher ISO, you risk getting a lot of grain in your image. So when you're choosing the right ISO, it could be a daunting task. What setting should I keep for the ISO? In general, you want to keep the ISO as low as possible so that you can get the most refined details in your image. As a rule of thumb, which I shouldn't be giving away by the way, because it depends entirely on what taste you have in photography, but I like to keep my ISO under 400 in all situations. If I'm shooting in the dark, 
uh, maybe in the evening where someone uh, there's not a, enough light around, I might go up to 800, but I try to avoid going anywhere beyond that. You could have a different taste in photography. You can choose a higher ISO with a different heavier camera body like the Canon 1XD. You could be shooting at an extremely high ISO without a lot of grain as well. But like I said, keep the ISO as low as you can, okay? And once you keep the ISO low, there is a problem that we face and that is the camera is less sensitive to light. So how do we make sure that a darker image with a low ISO is properly lit up? For that, stay tuned for the next lesson. Hello and welcome. This is a bonus lesson for the last lesson actually. The files that you received in raw format, they are CR2 formats, the camera raw version 2. You would need a Photoshop version, perhaps a Photoshop CC to open them up. And if you're able to open them up, you would also see the settings displayed on them. They show the ISO. You can also see the shutter speed and the f-stop. The value of the f-stop is shown with an f with it. It's more of an italic f. Okay, what's important in this lesson is that you need to understand the two things go together more often than in the opposite direction. We have covered so far the ISO and the shutter speed. If you increase the shutter speed, it gets darker. If you increase the ISO, it gets brighter. So in order to keep a balance, right? If one thing makes things darker, the other should make things brighter. So the shutter speed, as you start to increase the shutter speed, you will also need to increase the ISO because increasing the shutter speed makes things darker and to accommodate for that darkness, you might want to increase the ISO so that more light sensitivity appears inside your photograph. So as a rule, somewhere down the line when you're practicing photography, you will want to reach a balance between how much shutter speed should I increase and how much of the ISO should I increase. But like I said, you should try a lot to keep the ISO as low as possible and keep the shutter speed around the value for the lens that you're using. That's a quick hack that you can always use. And the last thing now left is the f-stop or the aperture of the camera. And that's coming up in the next lesson. So what's the takeaway from this lesson? Very important, ISO as low as possible and shutter speed, if you have increased it and things are getting darker, you might want to bump up the ISO a little. That's it, thank you very much for watching. Hello and welcome back to this lesson. We are going to now look into the exposure triangle, all right? Uh, we have a quick cheat sheet right in front of us on our computer screen. So without doing extra talking, let's do the working. Let's jump into it. So here we are. Okay, we talked about the ISO. Uh, we talked about the aperture, okay? The opening of the lens, that is, okay? How open the lens is. And we also talked about the shutter speed. How long does it take for us, for our camera to take the picture, okay? And these are the values. Now, even if you've not, you're not too good at memorizing these, you, this chart could really help you all. Okay, let's look at these. Now, let's start with the shutter speed, okay? If you want someone running, someone who's really running, and you want to freeze them in the moment, you have uh, Usain Bolt running and you're trying to shoot him, okay? And not like shoot him, like shoot him, but take a photograph. So you might be going somewhere as high as one one thousandth of a second, okay? To get the least motion blur. Okay, so he will be frozen in moment. Okay, he will be frozen in moment. So you want a really high, really, really high shutter speed for a fast moving object. But on the other side, if you see, this will be darker because as we go up in this shutter speed, it becomes brighter. So to compensate for the darker image, you need to be looking at somewhere higher in the ISO section or you could be looking somewhere 
more open on the aperture. So if I repeat myself, if you have someone frozen in time and he's running really fast, in order to freeze them, you're looking at one over one thousandth of a second, really high shutter speed, but the image will be dark. To compensate for that, you need to go brighter on these two things. Okay, and what are those brighter areas you could be looking at? You could be looking at the f stops. Okay, so what could be you looking at? You could you could be looking at the f stops. Okay, so let's look at these f stops. Now, if you notice, uh, these images show that there's a deep depth of field. That means the background is clear, and this is a shallow depth of field, meaning the subject we are shooting will be sharp. Okay, and the backgrounds will be blurred. Okay. So this case, when the background is all blurred away, you're going somewhere around f1.4 or f2 or f2.8, okay? Now, there is one issue. If you have to have clearer images of people running, you need to be somewhere around 2 and 2.8. This is the range we're looking at. I'm boxing this out, all right? So most of the times you're shooting someone who's running fast, for example, in this example, you need to be shooting somewhere around 2 and 2.8. And this will be blurring all the background and keeping the subject in focus. And we are going somewhere around 1,000 or 500 of a second for shutter speed. Now, there comes the ISO. Now, you'll have to be experimenting here, obviously, but when you have a 100 ISO, it's all clean. But as you go higher, the image gets brighter, but there's noise in it, okay? So you want to keep it low, somewhere around 400 to 800 will be a very high level of ISO that I would prefer. Okay, so the ISO settings would go, if you're shooting someone in the open day somewhere, you could be going somewhere like 400 to 800 ISO, okay? The aperture openings to around f2.8, okay? and the shutter speed around 1,500, okay, or 1,000th one, 1, of a second, okay? So this is where, so this is the setting set. These are the three most important settings you would require to shoot someone who's running fast. And this would obviously change in balance with each other if you're shooting someone else. If, for instance, for instance, in the open sun, we are trying to shoot someone in a portrait, okay? Uh, I'll just show you an example right now of a wedding shot we took, okay? Okay, so here we have, this is a wedding shot from uh, one of our events uh, when we were covering an event in a big fat wedding. And if you notice, all the background is so beautifully blurred out, okay? But the couple are clearly sharp and they're not moving, okay? So the ISO, was around 100, okay? The aperture. Now, if I wanted the background to be really clean, right, and clear, and you could tell all the leaves were there and what all was in the background, I would keep an aperture really high, okay? Uh, I would go somewhere around four, or maybe even uh, somewhere higher than that, 14, 10, somewhere there. But where was I keeping this? I was keeping this at two, okay? I stop at two. The shutter speed, they were not moving much. I was shooting it at an 85 mm lens, all right? I was shooting this with an 85 mm lens. So my shutter speed was somewhere around 60, okay? Closer to this 85, okay? Because when you keep it at around 60, your handshakes don't really come into play much. You can even go a little higher to avoid any blurring of images around their hair. So if I zoom in and show you how clean this image is. Just notice, okay? Here we have it, okay? If you notice, it's all so refined, okay? Okay, they're all clean. But if you notice, since I was keeping it around 2 f-stop, there is a little blurring near the ears. They're not clean. This part is a little blurred. The shoulder, which is closer, is clear, but this part, as I go further away, the hair is blurred out if you notice, okay? Now, and over here as well, and the lady's shoulder is cleaner here in this area, but this hair line, okay, these curls are faded. Now, why is that? Because I'm giving an F stop of two. If I had around F2.8, 
this hair would be cleaner but I would also get some background cleaned up as well. I would not have these completely bouquet and completely matted out and dreamy look to this image. I would not have that if I had the f-stop anywhere higher than this one. So this is how you want to keep the exposure triangle right every time when you're taking photos. And this won't happen the first time you take a photograph. Yes, it will take time. You'll have to master it. So this sheet that you have right here should really help, okay? Just remember, your, the first priority you need to have is if I want to have the background blurred out, I want it really neat. Once you've done with the aperture, you can start choosing from the shutter speed and where do you take the shutter speed? And it is somewhere around, if you have an 85 mm lens, okay, keep it to 1 60th of a second at least or 1 25th of a second that they would give you neat, clean pictures without motion blurs. And when we, when we come to the ISO, you would want to keep it as low as you can to keep a properly exposed, brightly lit picture. Don't want to go anywhere around 1600 or 3200. With good camera bodies these days, even these are clean images without much noise, but I would not prefer that for myself. So I hope uh, this really helped you understand how there is a balance that you need to strike for all these three things, the ISO, the aperture, and shutter speed. One quick tip for you is that you can start shooting an image, okay, and start with a certain aperture, okay, to see if the object is neat and everything else is blurred out, okay, like these people over here. I was keeping an f-stop of around 2, okay, and then start working with the shutter speed, okay, I've given you a tip for that as well, you look at the mm's on your lens, okay, so you just keep it as close as you can there, and then the only thing left behind is the ISO, try to keep it as low as you can, so around 400, somewhere around 400, 800, that's somewhere you need to keep these maxing them. Okay, and if your object is still not lit up, you will need flash, okay? And those are the things we will be covering up in the later lessons. So this is pretty much uh, an, a quick overview of what you might need uh, in understanding the exposure triangle. Thank you very much for watching. Hello and welcome back. This lesson is going to be really important. We are going to jump into the details of once you know the basics of a camera that we discussed in the previous section, about light and how you can get the right exposure. The next important thing that you're going to look into is composition. Now, simply put, what is composition? Anything that is involved inside a single frame that you can put in the right perspective to give a meaning to your picture is composition. In short, adding meaning to whatever you show inside a single frame is composition. You might want to keep it absolutely empty at places. You want to maybe um, overcrowd it at times. Maybe you want to create some patterns inside it. Maybe you want to focus your interest onto a single object at a place. So there are lots of ways you can compose a picture. We're going to look at some examples of good composition and then we're going to look into some techniques of composition in this section. So without further ado, Let's jump into the details of what a good composition really looks like and how do people, how do photographers reach that standard using some basic ideas. So let's get started. So here in our screen, we have um, some images. Now we look at the first image right here, okay? So if you look at this image, it's just a, a beautiful cake, okay, with a fork and a plate. But this is a beautifully composed picture, okay? I will try to analyze it for you right now, okay? Let's look at this. Um, look at how this leaf is actually leading all the focus towards this piece, okay? And how these lines, these parallel lines are so much in coordination with the direction in which the fork is placed, okay? And how everything is actually leading in a certain direction. You could have taken this picture in a completely different way and might not be looking great, but this picture is beautifully framed. Everything is following a certain pattern inside it. We call this a nice looking composition, 
We're going to keep it really simple, okay? Because we are beginners, so we're going to keep it not so complicated. You could obviously go into details of finding some really complex ways of composing pictures, but I'll just keep it simple for us because when we are starting, the best thing to do is keep things simple and rehearse it and perfect them. Now look at this one, okay? This is one uh, image we took uh, early morning in our village and there's a beautiful uh, wheat crop right there. It's all green, but the sun is rising in the background, okay? Beautiful picture. Uh, if you were there taking this picture, you might not be able to take this picture the first time you hold a camera, obviously. But here, if you notice, we put across something really important, okay? Uh, we have our whole focus lying somewhere around this area, okay? If you notice, this point, okay, is where the whole focus of the image really lies, okay? So if we could imagine, we have divided this up into three sections, if I must say, okay? I'll just roughly divide this all into three sections, okay? Let me show you that. Okay. Okay. Oops. So I'll just divide this up into three sections. I'll just duplicate it. And there we go. Okay. So here we are. We've divided this picture into three major sections. Okay. Now, if I look at a certain section if you see this point, okay? So I've divided this picture into three sections here and three horizontally, okay? Uh, okay, so if you look at this image, I've divided it up into three sections, okay? I'm just going to split it up, okay? So if we have this section divided up, we're looking at something in this corner and I really focused all the attention in this corner before I took this image. Same goes over here. If I could divide this up into three sections right there, okay? This area is where all the focus of this image actually lies, okay? So, good composition is not really difficult. You can create good composition from basic elements and we're going to look at how you could also do some of these composition tricks that we just looked into and create wonderful photos yourself. So, we'll see you in the next lesson with the rule of thirds, which is the first important one, followed by negative space and some balance and symmetry in the coming lessons. Thank you very much for watching. Hello and welcome back. This lesson is going to be about the rule of thirds. And this is a very basic composition technique that you can use to create wonderful images. So without further ado, let's jump into our computer screen and see how to compose this on an image. Okay, so here we are on our computer screen and we are looking at the image. Okay, we are looking at this wonderful image and most of it is empty if you see. And the major focus that we have is at a certain point. Okay, uh, that's the point we are going to look at right now. And that point, if you notice, is this one. Okay, we are focusing over here. Now, when you're taking the composition, when you're taking the picture, you could have had this image and imagined, all right, I need to put this insect right in the middle. Okay, and this would lead to some really boring composition, I would say. But if you can focus on these intersecting points, these are areas where naturally, if you're viewing an image, these are areas where your eyes feel things are most pleasing, okay? So, when you're composing an image, you can obviously turn this grid on in some cameras, turn on the rule of thirds or uh, you can also call it the grid, okay? It's a three cross three grid, okay? There are, there's one, two, three, uh, I'll use a different color, four, five, six, okay? I'll just number them again for you, yeah, like this. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, all right? So this is a three cross three grid, and you might be looking at intersections in the middle somewhere over here to create a wonderful images, okay? So whenever you're composing, an image, try to keep your subject somewhere between the intersection of those lines that we've identified right now. So if I call these hotspots, okay, and I call this one A, 
Yeah, this one B, this one C, and this one D. And we are going to look at some more images and see how they are composed and see if they could be improved in composition. Okay, so here we go. So here we have another image. Okay, so now we've kept this image not in the perfect composition, but we wanted that for the sake of example, you should be able to tell if this is a properly composed image using the rule of thirds or is there something new inside it okay so i'm just quickly going to create some lines over here so i'm going to divide it horizontally okay for your ease like that and i'm also going to divide it vertically so let's go somewhere like that okay and another one Okay, so let's look at this image. Is it properly composed at all? Well, not really. And that is why even though this is overall looking nice, but you could have had these placed in different positions to improve the composition. What you could have done when taking this picture, what, what the photographer could have done is kept them somewhere in the middle of these areas. Let's see. If this cup of coffee beans was placed right here, the other one right in the middle, okay, and this one intersecting between them. So if I roughly draw it, if these were placed in such ways that they were amongst the intersecting lines, okay, this image would have improved a lot. You could also place them at different other positions as well. Let's look at some other examples. Okay, let's see. If, for instance, I had positioned this cup over here, this cup over there, and this cup over there, okay, that could also create good composition. Or if I could keep them diagonal, okay, let's look at how we could use diagonals with this rule of thirds to make good composition. Imagine that we had placed this cup over here, over here, and over here, okay, through this imaginary line. Now this could also help create a better composition. But right now the image that we see, even though it looks all right, but this is not the perfect image you could use uh, when you're using the rule of thirds, okay. But to keep it simple, you could use some diagonals, you could use different alternative boxes like the one we use one, two, and you could use three. If you have more objects to consider in an image. For instance, you have five objects, okay? You could go with one in here, second in here, third in the middle, fourth over there, fifth over there. You could rearrange them, all right? In a sort of an X formation. This would lead you to some sort of a balanced uh, photography uh, eventually when you're starting off, okay? But let's look at another image to check the rule of thirds, okay? If that really fits in with the rule of thirds. Okay, so now we're looking at this image right now, okay? Now, what is this image doing here? Let's see, is it following any rule of thirds or not? Okay, let's see. Well, not specifically, all right? So, but still, it, it looks like a good image. Now, why is that so? Because this image is taken using a different technique or a different composition idea, okay? So not always does the rule of third really fit in, but still if you notice, we've got the main subject right in the middle, okay? And somewhere around in this third area, okay, we have this kite. And if the kite were right there in the intersection, this would have been a much better image if, if the um, image was taken with the kite just on the intersecting lines. But I would not comment any further on uh, how this picture is taken. This looks wonderful. But why? Because we are using some other ideas in it. And that idea is leading lines and negative space. So, but this image is using some unique ideas. And those ideas are negative space and leading lines. Okay. So these are the ones we are going to cover up in the next lesson. So stay tuned. We'll be discussing this image in the next lesson. Hello and welcome back. This lesson is going to bring together two important composition concepts.
and those are negative space and leading lines. So let's get into the details. Okay, so here we are on our computer screens. And if you notice, we have a lot of blue color over here, the, the beautiful sky, okay, and it's empty. So the basic concept of negative space is that you keep focus on your subjects, okay, these are the two subjects here. One is the boy uh, flying the kite and the second is the kite itself, okay, and the rest is just emptiness, okay. You want to keep it really clean and really neat and everything fades away into one background. So the sky is giving negative space and helping pop out the kite and the boy. Now, this is not just a very um, ordinary picture, if I would say. It's, it's, it's a nice attempt at a leading lines idea as well. And what's that? If you notice, the guy is standing on railway lines and these are the leading railway lines, all right? There is one problem though, and that is this picture is taken uh, in a hurry, I would say. It wasn't really completely thought, okay? So you could have had this kite fly a little over here and have the rule of thirds applied to this. If you could move this image a little left, okay? You could have these lines converge, okay? And create a wonderful image in the end, okay? That would create a very nice effect and have the lines lead you to the subject. So if you notice, these railway lines over here are leading you to the boy who is flying the kite. So here we could have had three basic elements of uh, composition together. We, we could have had the rule of thirds, okay? We could have had the negative space, which we do have here, okay? We do have a nice empty space here. We do have leading lines, all right? So to an ordinary eye, these are good leading lines enough, but I've told you how you could have improved this image, but that's why composition is not just something you can start to learn right off uh, your video, those you're watching right now. You need to go out in the field and start to practice these things one at a time, okay? We'll look at another image where we have leading lines and I'll leave it to you to identify where they get, went wrong in taking the image. Okay, so here we have another image, let's see. So how does this fit in? We have a good negative space there, okay? This is nice, okay? And this is beautiful sky, wonderful beach in Australia. And we do have some leading lines here, if you notice. See? We do have some leading lines, but they're breaking off here, okay? So if you have moved forward and cropped this out, okay, into this area, you have a wonderful composition for yourself, okay? So this is how you can use negative space and the leading lines together to create wonderful, especially landscape photographies. So I hope you put these things into practice. It can be done in a day, I understand, but it's a good start if you start taking photos using your iPhone if you want or any other cameras that you have and start to look for these small little composition tricks and put them into practice. Best of luck and hope this works for you. Hi and welcome back. This lesson is really important and we are focusing on balance and symmetry for creating a wonderful composition. So without further ado, let's jump into our computer screens and look at some examples of how to balance your images and how to bring a sort of symmetry or asymmetrical patterns inside your photography. So let's jump into the details. So here we are. Now we're looking at something called balance and then symmetry, okay? So in this image that you see, there is no symmetry, that's for sure. What is symmetry? Symmetry is when you have something repeating, all right? You have an image over here, you have another image over there. You can have a mirror line somewhere. We'll look at some examples of those as well. But we do have balance in this image. Now, what is that balance? Let's, let's, let's try and understand that. We have our subject here, okay? And if you notice, there's a lot of negative space here that's all filled up. This is the negative space filled up here, okay? But to balance out that visual gap, we have our shoot right here. Let me show you this edited version. If you notice this one, there is a sort of a void that you feel on this side. This left side is okay. We have 
the subject. That is understandable, right? But, but there's a lot of void, emptiness on this right side. It feels like it is asking that there should have been something there, okay? So to balance this visually, okay, or we also call the visual balance, we need to have, along with the negative space, some object on the other side to keep a balance in our photography. It doesn't have to be the same object. It doesn't have to be of extreme importance in your picture, but it should fill up the space there. So if you notice now, this object over here, this shoot that I'm talking about, I'll remove the rest of the annotations for ease. Now you see this image now, okay, this image is balanced, all right? Why? Because we have our subject and we have something maybe not that extraordinary to this image, but it's balancing out the negative space and giving us a more balanced and visually appealing image compared to this image over here, which sort of feels like just an amateur picture in someone trying to just shoot something in the sky, okay? So that's about visual balance, okay? And if you are looking for shooting objects which are maybe tiny or maybe you're keeping it in the third part of the image using the rule of thirds, but you might want to also consider that on the other side of the void, on the other side of the negative space, you need to have something that fills up the gap and balances things out. So that's all about this section on visual balance. Now we are going to look at symmetry, okay? And before we move on, this sort of balance, uh, we call it, so it's called asymmetrical balance, okay? We have asymmetrical balance. Specifically, we are saying that we don't have a symmetry in this image, but there is balance in it. On the other side, what, what, what do we do with symmetry, okay? This is where the part of uh, mirrors or reflections come into play in our photography. Okay, and this is when you split something right in the middle and the image looks perfectly balanced on either side. We'll look at some examples right now, okay? So, we have symmetry here. Let's look at this image. So, it's a wonderful building, okay? And before you can take this image, you need to understand, you need to do some micro balancing of your body. Whenever you're going to shoot, you're going to look for symmetry before you can shoot symmetry, okay? So if you notice, we have a wonderfully balanced image and the lines of symmetry go right from the top and split it into two halves, one on either side. So we have the left and the right sort of showing a symmetry. So this is also one way when you're not able to shoot something out on a day and you're feeling a little depressed, you can go out and look for symmetry. Now this is not just with buildings, okay? Uh, you don't need only buildings in this. You could be shooting all sorts of symmetry. It could be plants, it could be head shots, it could be uh, the middle of the road somewhere, okay? So looking for symmetry can help you really pump up your game in composition. So if you have these two ideas clear for you, the visual balance where there is no symmetry, but you keep something other than the main subject to balance things out, and the other example where you keep symmetry, splitting things into equal proportions on either side or in any directions, but keeping the patterns repeating. That's symmetry for you. So I hope this lesson really helped you to understand how you can look for these patterns in the nature around when you're taking your photographs to create a wonderful composition. Thank you very much for watching. Hello and welcome back. In this lesson, we're moving on and we're going to learn four different ways in which you can use different angles and perspective to create wonderful compositions. So without further ado, let's look at some examples and let's get started. So here we are, the first important perspective you can use, the first different angle you can use when you're shooting something, is you can photograph up or down, okay? Let's look at this example. Uh, you're in the middle of a city, right? And you have wonderful skyscrapers. And what you can do is shoot right up, 
okay? And look at this beautiful way of putting this image. You're just shooting right up. You're not shooting head on. You're not looking at different angles, just straight up. This is a wonderful example of using the angle really creatively. Uh, the second example we have here is to lie down and shoot from ground level, okay? Let's look at this example, okay? This, this photograph is shot on an iPhone, all right? And it was just an empty road to the forest. And we just had to put the camera right on the road in the middle, okay? And watch out when you're doing that, obviously, because there's traffic and you, you, know, you, you might get into some trouble. But if you're comfortable going down, lying down on the floor and taking a low angle picture, well, you can obviously have some really creative images coming out then. Uh, the third different way we are looking at right now is shooting through objects, okay? Let's look at this example. This was a library and we have this library and there was a mirror right in the middle. And we had a plain glass separator between them. Okay, so the library and us were separated by this plain glass and there were bouquet and there were lights in our background and these background lights that you see right here, okay, these bouquet that we get are because of the reflection of us standing behind the glass. So essentially, this is what it is. You have an object the other object which you're shooting, the subject that, that I mean is over there and you are shooting from behind or through an object. So we're shooting right now through a plain glass and this really gives a cool feeling to this image. So this is another way of using a different way of looking through things. You don't necessarily have to be in clean, plain sight. You could be shooting through objects. Another creative way of using your imaging is to fill the frame. Let's look at this one. This was shot on an iPhone 12 Pro Max and using the macros camera, very simple, okay? And look at this image, very beautiful, okay? We just had the bees sitting right in the middle of the sunflower and took a low angle and filled up all this photograph, okay? Instead of having all the other petals show up, we just zoomed real close. Okay, and this is also another way to have wonderfully creative compositions. So with all these different examples, uh, you must have some really creative ideas coming in your life when you're looking around to take pictures. Just be creative, keep these in sight. You could be looking for number one, shooting right up or right down if you're on top of a building. You could lie down on the floor and take a photograph. You could be shooting through objects or you could be filling in the frame where you zoomed in as well. In the next lesson, we are going to look at how to choose a nice, decent background for your image and just reposition yourself to get a decent image. And once we're done with these, we'll be moving on to the focus and depth of field section in the coming lessons. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome back. This lesson is the most important lesson if you were to choose from all the composition lessons, okay? And this is about looking at the background when you're taking the picture. So without further ado, let's look at three different examples and let's analyze what could have been done better to make these photographs even better than they are actually. Okay, so let's jump into the details. So here we are. Look at this image one, two, and three. Okay, now in these images, uh, let's look at this image. Uh, this is a wonderfully captured image. I think it is a balanced image. You see how the background is giving complete space for this guy to be popping out. Uh, the colors on the shirt, the trousers, the shoes, the style is almost perfectly in balance, okay? But this image is similar to that image with the exception that there are some things that are more of a distraction, okay? The audience is a distraction, I understand that, but this could have been improved. Look carefully, right now, the place where, the position what we are shooting him at, okay, we are shooting right into this guy, okay, and there is this pole poking into his head, uh, there are people behind him, this is what I call noise, okay the noise in the background. You want to get rid of the noise as much as you can for a wonderful photo. 
What's the difference between photograph 2 and photograph 1? Okay? Although photograph 1 also had noise, if you notice, look at this pole right there. If we were shooting him somewhere in this angle, like this photograph 2 were shot, this pole would be sticking around somewhere like this. But this is a low angle shot. You're shooting him from the bottom up. But this is headshot. You know, you're going straight into uh, the subject and shooting. But if we were lying on the floor and shooting up, we could get rid of this pole sticking right there. We could have him all against this blown out sky, okay? Although the colors of the sky are also not showing, that's also a mistake in this photo. This, this is overexposed, but still, going lower in this image and shooting upwards a little, shooting a little higher while you're on the floor, on the, on the road, would have given a much better spacing, much better pop to this image. Let's look at this image over here. Okay, this is a wonderfully balanced image, I would say. The colors are neat, that's all right. But what's really happening? What's wrong? Yes, you're right. Look at this, the framing. Now, you could have moved a little right, a little left, and just avoid this strange frame of the window popping out of the girl's head. You know, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say here. So this is very basic movement that you need to do to get clean, noise-free backgrounds, okay? So you don't necessarily have to be in the studio. You don't need to have a wonderful location. You just need to avoid noise, anything that is going to look awkward in the image by the end. So whenever you're framing, look around, move to the left, move to the right, move a little low, move a little high, look for the perfect positioning of your subject with respect to the background. And I hope you're going to make some wonderful photos. That's it for this lesson. In the next section, we are moving on to the depth of field and more exciting lessons. So stay tuned. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.